I think now we'll open it up for questions, but I just wanted to say that before we started the panel, I had this general question that I wanted to ask everybody, which was, so what are we going to do? But I think that I want to address that to this room, because you all here are the ones that are going to help us do that. Um, you're the makers and the thinkers and the producers and the consumers that I think have a lot of power in how these questions get answered. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up. And we have a microphone that needs to be passed around. So wait for it. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the shift to mobile platforms, um, because as a, design, as a design solution, it kind of has caused this um, shift away from uh, what Sophia mentioned earlier, like this uh, people who grew up with the internet um, had the ability to sort of like access like the back door, like um, what Anne mentioned, like uh, accessing the code. Um, but now with, uh, with the shift to mobile platforms, a lot of that is more opaque. Um, and then places like in less developed nations where the mobile platform is like the um, the less expensive option to access the web, um, it creates like this sort of uh, inaccessibility of the the code or the the, the back door that uh, has been really important to like um, uh, like um, this like fighting the web, sort of, like for hacking and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, the shift. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're nailing it in that the hardware is a constraint. It's another one of the constraints, right? So often I talk about um, if I did, if I collected searches and the display was the, the size of the Empire State Building, there'd be a lot more to talk about, right? A, a lot more available. And conversely, when you do the search on a mobile phone, now you're getting, you know, a third or less. I got the big phone, you know what I'm saying? But if you got the, if you got the little one, because um, I can't read, I'm just blind. Um, so you got to, so this is a constraint. And I don't think that it's these kinds of conversations. I mean, I'm pretty, I feel like I could make a pretty, pretty good bet that these kinds of conversations are not going down in hardware manufacturing design. Right, where we like go, hey, what would happen if people only got, you know, the first five hits versus, or they couldn't edit code, right, from their mobile device? I mean, in fact, that the, um, we talk about these as in in, the, in a scholarly way as digital enclosures, right, and the normalization of these digital enclosures, mobile being a really important one. Um, is something that is very difficult for us to intervene upon, right? We have more black boxing, so to speak, of the technology than ever. And, um, and it is hard to hack, harder to hack. Um, and even the idea of hacking it, you know, over the course of 25 years, ha you know, uh, has become more pejorative, right? In kind of the, a legalistic way, certainly criminalized in many ways. So, um, you're, you're nailing the right questions, and I think we have to figure it out. Maybe that means, you know, you'll help us, like, lead us to these other alternate platforms where we can try to do something different. Um, and people are trying to intervene with different kinds of mobile technologies. You might have seen that block phone, right, that's all components where you can, you know, instead of throwing the whole phone out when one thing fails, you just take out the component part, so it's like a sustainability. Well, it didn't used to be a Google project. I guess they took it over because, before, like, two years ago it wasn't. Um, but they buy everything. So, like, you know, anything good, you guys are going to make, like, be millionaires when you come up with these good ideas. Um, is that the intervention? I don't know. Then we'll have to figure out at a certain point, will Google get broken up like AT&T was? I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? But I think it's an important question. It's more constraining, probably, than many other um, devices we're dealing with. Well, and if we think about ideas of a digital divide, if, if that's a useful framework to even kind of use, right, is having access on a mobile phone to the internet the same as having access via a laptop or even if you think kind of in 
more even within kind of the realm of kind of computer access to the internet, right, is having broadband access at home the same or has having it at your school kind of the same as having actual kind of empowered internet access in a kind of complete way? Yeah, the, this is about consumption, being a, an audience, a 24-7 always on consumptive audience, right? It's not really f for producing in the same way. Otherwise, everybody would be trying to design on this and they're not. Thanks. Uh, this is for Professor Noble, um, but or it's about something Professor Noble said, but it's open to the panel. Uh, I guess I should stand. So um, about the implementation of how we regulate a search engine like Google um, or any other entity online that's responsible for disseminating information at request. Um, the Forbes article seemed to think that uh, there's definitely a, a legal and, and maybe a moral responsibility of, of doing that. And how do you go about that when responses that people could probably get from Google are that our motivators are not only profit but usability and they'll, they'll argue it from a very technical side of, of the equation. And also, specifically with Google, as, as I think we, everyone can agree, it's, it's a major one to target. That company in particular, at their outset, you're probably aware of it, their main uh, philosophy uh, was like literally the phrase, don't be evil, when they founded Google. It's um, still the Wi-Fi password on their shuttles. That's amazing. I was um, just there. Yeah. So how do you implement that kind of change or convince legislators of that kind of regulation um, when legislators are probably going to see things from that side, at least, at least now, um, in, in, the, in the development of these ideas? And how do you actually um, not just convince people, but are there other ways of, of getting it regulated? Um, and can you do it without can you do it non-cooperatively? Can you, is there are there ways to get the same effects uh, without actually getting Google to change their algorithms or their policies? It's an excellent question. So when the Federal Trade Commission started investigating Google a few years ago, about four years ago or so, um, into its monopoly practices, ultimately the FTC decided that Google um, was not a monopoly and had a right to perform its business duties any way it felt necessary, right? Um, so part of what we're dealing with is, as you all know, of course you can't leave design school without knowing what neoliberalism is. So in the neoliberal kind of economic policy environment, where in the United States since the 1980s, we've really um, stepped up our game around privatization and, um, you know, corporate control um, of many aspects of kind of what we're, we previously might have thought of as part of like a public domain or public institutions that might provide a resource. Um, now we're in, a, in an era where it seems wholly logical to most people that corporations would provide those resources to us, right? So this is one of the reasons why people report um, a high degree of confidence in Google or in search engines, for example, um, because it, it seems normal to have a private company or, or even a publicly traded company do that rather than, say, the library. And so we had a total divestment from public libraries or public institutions that could have built these technologies too, but do, are not resourced at the level. The government also provided a lot of government contracts to Google, right, but not to other public institutions to do some of the work that it's done, right? So Google's massively funded by the U.S. government. Um, so there's, so part of this is like the environment, right, the neoliberal economic environment that we're operating in. Now I think there is some really, I, I would be on the side of giving testimony about regulation if invited to. Um, and I think we're seeing in the EU some really hard come down, crackdowns on the role of Google as a commercial uh, private company, so to speak, working solely in its own kind of um, profit motive um, paradigm, uh, you know, uh, with, a, with a different set of end goals than maybe public institutions um, would provide. You know, in the U.S. it's very difficult because we have very strong discourses um, now more than ever about distrusting the state or distrusting government, you know, and Europe, um, 
people have a different sensibility in many different countries about the role of the state. So this is part of why it's, the EU is actually imposing a lot of sanctions on Google around their kind of non-competitive or anti-competitive practices um, and blocking out other companies and really um, their straight up monopoly practices and they're, they're issuing a lot of um, pushback. And researchers are thinking about alternatives and they're very well organized differently than we're organized here. Um, so I think that you know we might get some relief, so to speak, or some models that come out of the EU that might help us shift the discourse here in the U.S. But I have to say that, that you know, at the same time, UCLA just e outsourced its email to Gmail. So what? I mean, you know, it's like what you can't win. I, you know, we have these public institutions all over the country that are just outsourcing to these ed tech companies and other kinds of companies and, um, and divesting the public you know, dollars from these kinds of projects. So it's, it's real difficult, but I think it's worth fighting for, certainly, because we really don't know the end. Star we're starting to see some of the um, problematics, right, of the, like, incredible surveillance that's happening, the loss of control over our digital identities. If you think you have control over it, you don't, right? Everything, the documenting of your every sp utterance, uh, once it goes on the web, I tell people it's written in pen. You know, maybe it's tattooed. I don't know. It's like really hard to get off. So all the implications of what it means to have our, all of our lives and all of our information. Um, uh, John Fran Francois Blanchet talks about the social f value of forgetfulness, right? Of forgetting. We're losing our ability to forget the things that should be forgotten also, right? Be Wait until you try to run for Senate or Congress, some of you in this room, and some pictures or texts roll up. I mean, you know, it's like that. I know people are like, don't bring it up. Um, so I think, I think, you know, we have yet to see, and maybe it will, it will come about that when these really um, negative, profoundly negative consequences of, the, of, of, the, uh, of what it means for these companies to control um, everything about what we say and what we do. I mean, even this talk is online right now, probably right now. I'm just, then maybe we'll push back. It's going to take a lot more than just regulation. It'll take a culture shift, too. Do we have one in the front? Hi. Yeah. Hello. Should I stand up or just? Yes, yeah, stand up. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so this is kind of piggybacks off of what we've been discussing, but. Um, We've been talking about like the corporatization of online space, but also like online activism in the same at the same time. Um, so I guess my question is, what is the dangers of activism happening within a corporate space? And then also thinking about like Tumblr was specifically mentioned, and like in my opinion, Tumblr is kind of different from online spaces. And I would just like to talk about like why is that? <laughs> I love Tumblr. Uh, I'm not on any social media site except for Tumblr, and it's great. I feel like I've learned more from being on social justice uh, blogs on Tumblr, Black Tumblr, during Blackout Day, Trans Day of Visibility, than my entire like critical theory degree in graduate school at CalArts, like for real. And I think one of the things about Tumblr that, that it's maybe like a step away from Facebook in that you can be completely anonymous on there, like you don't have to reveal any of your own information. And the information that you choose to reveal is often, um, you know, like, yeah, like, hey, I'm like a 15-year-old gender queer person living in the middle of nowhere, and I can, I can change the CSS and HTML on my Tumblr. And I think that there's something about it that's like a little MySpace-y in that way. Um, I mean, obviously, Tumblr, like, it's not a utopia. There are pl plenty, of, plenty of problems on Tumblr. But I think that there's something about it that, uh, this is also a general question that I wanted to ask about anonymity and, like, anonymous and the hacktivist, you know, kind of, like, work of anonymous. I wonder if anonymity on the internet is also, like, in service to some kind of political action that can be good. Like, I wonder if the reason why Tumblr feels different is because you can choose, like, you don't have to use your real name, right? Like, so on Facebook, this is a problem. If you 
want to use a different name than your given name. Say you're a trans person who doesn't want to be, use your given name. And Facebook has this policy, right, of asking you or demanding, like, is this your real name? Um, so I wonder about that, like, level of anonymity and how that works. And yeah, what do you all think about anonymous? <laughs> I, can speak, I think I can speak generally to anonymity as a, um, it's both, I think it's incredibly powerful and, and, and incredibly dangerous um, at the same time in, in, in ways that I'm still kind of grappling with. And uh, um, it, uh, uh, a friend of mine who's a researcher, her name's Trisha Wong, and she put forth this idea, especially specifically around Tumblr, um, it, um, uh, but uh, I guess any, any sort of social network that allows for kind of flexible uh, performance of identity. Um, is the ability to um, to explore um, different identities um, and to, to to benefit from anonymity and not have to be locked into who you are. Um, it, and her, she uses the phrase elastic self, which I just love. That this um, and um, and you know in cities traditionally the, the ability to go to a gay bar or to um, to go to a um, you know these kind of third spaces um, where you could explore a different sort of identity or a different sort of self um, with um, with what you would hope is some level of anonymity um, in, in um, away from like this kind of smaller villages or towns that you might come from, um, you know, we can analogize that with the, um, with uh, some of these flexible spaces um, that allow for, um, if not anonymity, then at least pseudonymity um, or or some sort of a flexible identity. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that anonymity um, on the internet is, is truly possible, um, given uh, given um, just uh, the, the level of of, uh, of the amount of data that's collected about how how we're using the web um, uh, that could be debated. Um, but um, the flexible identity seems really important. But at the same time, um, and we, you know, we saw this with the, the Dylan Roof example, um, it's, al it's also a great way to perform um, dangerous identities as well and to discover um, different sides of yourself that, um, that um, you may not have explored and that um, are actually harmful to society. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue I'm still you know, grappling with. And I, th um, and I, I think um, you know, there are these incredible benefits for marginalized communities, but mar being marginalized can also, um, you know, marginal viewpoints can also be um, you know, misogyny might be considered a, a, a marginalized viewpoint in terms of the ability to express direct misogyny in, in public discourse in the U.S. is quite limited, um, and yet on the internet, what we see is these extremely direct misogyny, um, and so that the ability to to be pseudonymous or anonymous um, can promote um, both harmful and helpful um, um, attitudes. And uh, so, it's, it, I think it's a, it's a difficult a difficult question. I think there's there's a lot of things to speak to in both kind of of your questions. Um, but thinking about kind of activism for a second, and we can think about anonymous as kind of a specific instance of kind of digital activism and its potential. Um, I actually, this is one of the things we were talking about in my class yesterday, and the kind of potential for activism using what can kind of be done well uh, in terms of online activism. What is it? Is it kind of the same valuation to like something, to like a social justice cause? on Facebook as it is to go to a march or to engage in some kind of more traditional form of protest. Um, and I'm actually really intrigued by the fact that most of my students um, did not see kind of, they see digital tools as enabling kind of traditional activism, but that the actual, just the kind of digital, the purely digital activism doesn't actually they don't see it as kind of having much power for change, which was interesting to me. Um, and that they were very drawn. There was things they still wanted, even from activist movements that had come out of digital space, in part out of digital spaces, right? So thinking about Black Lives Matter and other kinds of quote unquote, like hashtag activism, right? That they still are not convinced that it can make positive social change without uh, having a kind of traditional hierarchy and platform of demands. Um, they were particularly critical. Most of them were on board with kind of Black Lives Matter's message, but don't think it actually can in, kind of provoke real change without a kind of more traditional activist kind of platform where, say, you're going to take a legal kind of approach to uh, ending kind of racism in the criminal justice system and things. So. There's, I think there's lots of interesting questions to ask about kind of what digital spaces can do well and what they don't do well. And some of that is related to kind of issues that have already come up around language, right? There's been Ramesh Srinivasan, who's in our department, writes a lot about um, kind of the, uh, the Arab Spring and the use of Twitter there and where those people who are using Twitter actually are and what was actually done in kind of digital spaces versus in kind of 
in physical spaces as well. So there's lots of interesting questions to ask there. And um, the speaking of kind of misogyny in online spaces, there's a really great, um, Lindy West has a really great story um, about uh, one of her kind of her internet, her misogynist internet trolls actually kind of coming out to her as who he actually is and them having a conversation, which is really fascinating if you're interested in that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, you know, if you start, if you look back pre-digital to the types of surveillance that activists, especially in the U.S., um, on the left uh, in particular, um, have been under, I think the Internet um, exacerbates that level of surveillance, the end. I mean, that's just what happens. And so it's, it's hard for me to get on board with... Um, thinking that the internet is some type of liberatory space because it actually heightens. I mean, now every single person who's ever tweeted on any cause is identifiable. And trust, for those of us who've been trolled on the internet, you know, we, we know what the real threat of that kind of trolling is also. Um, you know, I think Anonymous, you know, that's a complicated organization, loosely like in, in Quoty Fingers organization, in that, um, you know, early early days of Anonymous were all about the kind of bro culture, sexism and trolling and racism, and now they're doing like op Operation KKK or Operation Hoods Off. And I'm like, what? When did that happen? So Anonymous itself is not really a monolithic thing. Um, it's a lot of different people with a lot of different agendas that are happening there. And I think one of the things that's interesting about what Anonymous has been doing, I've been watching them um, like fiercely since the Paris bombing is uh, on Twitter is that they're doing a lot to talk about um, like they're taking down ISIS pro ISIS Twitter accounts so they're claiming to have taken down like more than 6,000 um, Twitter accounts and ISIS sympathizer um, accounts in the last week and so um, and they're issuing guides on um, how to do hacktivism for everyday people, which is also interesting. But here's the thing, you know, not everybody knows how to like open up an RRC channel and how to really get anonymous. Um, that's difficult. That's not like an everyday user kind of experience. And, um, and also people who do that level of really trying to conceal their identity or where they're searching, if they're using Tor and these kinds of things, those are actually being criminalized. So, you know, it's like, can you do that? I mean, to me, people of color, people who are on the margin using those kinds of technologies are more at risk, um, you know, because of the criminalization of that kind of engagement. So I guess I feel like it's layered. I don't, I don't disagree with anything that's been said here, I mean, about the identity work that we can do and making ourselves visible and the education we can do definitely is happening. At the same time, when we think about where the real power is, how power operates at the level of the state or other types of organizations, you know, law enforcement, um, Homeland Security, NSA, I think that um, we're seeing people lose their jobs over their political activism online. Um, we're seeing, uh, mostly uh, even kind of like right-wing extremists, you know, in the United States, white supremacists, um, kind of what we might call like our homeland terrorists, um, not criminalized, right, but other kinds of activists criminalized. So these things are still explicitly political around kind of the, the agenda and the tensions we have in the United States. I'm more, I'm, if we look pre-internet, again, at, at projects like COINTELPRO, the Co counterintelligence program of the United States government, everybody go watch the COINTELPRO 101 documentary. Um, these practices of surveilling women's organizations, um, anti-war protesters, um, uh, Puerto Rican independence movement, uh, civil rights and black power activists, um, brown power activists, it's like, who's left? I don't know, whoever's left, I mean, like, there's not, what, what's left are, is the Klan, right, or n Nazis, or, you know, kind of that right-wing extremism that's less surveilled and less, facing far less consequence. So these, these things happened before the internet, and I think the internet is actually making people who are trying to do progressive work more visible and are potentially facing greater consequence for that visibility.
if anybody has one last question, short, and then we'll wrap it up. There's somebody. Oh, the microphone is coming to you. Hi. Um, there was like a brief section where you guys were talking about how a lot of the information, especially during the AIDS movement, was archived. Like in this age where there is official commentary about issues, but there's also a lot of like backhanded commentary through the comments or through Twitter or things. Where do those play in the like idea of archival images or like archival data and like? Do you think they have like potential power where they stand? Like, where does that fit in the idea of technology in the digital age? That's a really good and interesting question. Um, so, speaking to the archiving question for a second there, which is really what kind of my I feel like my primary area of expertise is. But um, it's there's lots of arguments right about whether we will actually there is so much information, but whether we will actually whether that information will continue to exist, right? Websites, you stop paying for your domain name, they might disappear, right? Uh, we have the potential to um, preserve more data, but we know less about preserving this data. We know a lot. We know a lot about preserving paper. We don't know a whole lot yet about preserving kind of digital materials of all kinds and digital materials of course degrade like other materials do or and they're kind of ephemeral and people don't maintain them uh, or conceptualize of them necessarily in the same way right um, so th there's of course the question of whether we will actually kind of have there's a potential for kind of an endless the internet as this kind of endless expansive notion of an archive right but we may in fact have less information at some point um, about kind of certain moments and particularly this moment. Um, so that's an interesting question. And then a lot of the, what the poster I showed at the end, a lot of what the artists are responding to um, is this kind of nostalgia for an earlier period of activism and for a particular kind of activism, right? And a particular kind of attention to AIDS and an attention to AIDS in the past as something that is done. Of course, AIDS is not done. Um, and. Um, they're critiquing, in particular, the kind of decontextualization of those images. Uh, and that is something that happens particularly kind of in a digital space, right? You can do a Google image search and maybe something from ACT UP will pop up and you can reuse it in, well, there's copyright issues, but right, you can theoretically use it in any way you want to, right? So it's then kind of divorced from its entire kind of contextual history you can know little to nothing about kind of the AIDS movement and still kind of re create those images, right? And I think that's where Justin Bieber perhaps comes into that image, right? Does Justin Bieber know who ACT UP is or was? Does Justin Bieber have an investment in AIDS activism? He's never, as far to my knowledge, said anything publicly. Or did Justin Bieber's stylist just think ACT UP, the ACT UP logo made a cool t-shirt? We're not sure. Um, I don't want to Maybe Justin Bieber is secretly a, a AIDS activist, but um, there's not to critique his politics. Um, but it's the kind of the potential for decontextualization of images, right? Is in, is huge. So that we partake, so these kind of images of AIDS proliferate, but the actual knowledge about AIDS does not necessarily proliferate, and it only is looking at a particular kind of iconic moment of AIDS and so it distracts from having conversations about AIDS now and AIDS as a kind of global endemic and AIDS in the United States as something that of course disproportionately impacts women of color and poor people and trans people and people of color kind of more broadly and that, that it won't be part of what I think my argument will be is that it won't be documented. AIDS now will not be documented in the way that AIDS was in the 1980s and 1990s. And part of that is, of course, the reason that things get documented. Archives reflect kind of notions of power, right? Who has access to power and who thinks they're important and whose lives we think are important um, in the kind of archival world. And what kind of, what activism looks like and what digital activism looks like and it will be hard to know and there are lots of issues right if we think about use of proprietary platforms there right it's technically Facebook owns everything you put on Facebook so there are uh, serious concerns about whether you're actually legally able to kind of preserve your 
the activism you do on Facebook because that data doesn't technically belong to you, so you cannot donate that data to an archive. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's time. Think Shinyu, it's are we time. doing a reception in the back? Yeah, the reception okay. is upstairs. Yeah, so we'll have a reception back in, in upstairs right here in the, in the room so we can continue some of the conversations. Um, this has been an extraordinary evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us and sharing these ideas, many of them horrifying. <laughs> but incredible to be having this conversation in this room. Yeah. So deepest thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thank you, audience. Um, and then I really also want to especially thank the techno-diversity team at the Void Lab. So that's Shin Yu. Can you raise your hand so we can acknowledge you? <laughs> Peter. Peter, where are you? <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> and Lillian. Yes, this was totally student initiated this evening. So thank you so much. It's really amazing that this is There's an echo. An echo. Way in the back. Yeah. You guys are amazing. Thank you for having us.